watching this via YouTube. This is number 116 of Mind Brain Connections for the YouTube presentation. It's 110. What we're going to be talking about tonight is connecting resurrection life with living in the end, collapsing time, and then eventually creating a vacuum. Now, I received a private Facebook message after I ministered the message two weeks ago, and I was talking about collapsing time, and one of my Facebook friends sent me a private message, and they were giving me an example of what came to their mind as I was ministering on collapsing time a couple weeks ago. And she said the illustration she got was taken from John chapter 2, where Jesus performed the first miracle. Of course, it was at a wedding, a joining. And remember, his mother came to him and said they ran out of wine, they need this water to be turned into wine, or they need more wine. So he told them to go get the six water pots, fill them with water, and then he transmuted the water or changed the water into wine. Now, here's the allegorical reality of this, of collapsing time here. He turned that water into the best wine, which best wine is something that takes ages to become best wine. And immediately, so we can see how he collapsed time there. He didn't wait ages or years for that wine to become the best wine or aged wine. He immediately transmuted. He immediately turned the water into wine. That's a good example of collapsing time. And so we're going to talk about that tonight. And let me just say as we get into this, when one truly lives in resurrection life subjectively, they're living in the end, they're collapsing time, and they're also creating a vacuum. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight as we connect resurrection life living, not just having that resurrection life as our objective reality, but really living in it, walking in it subjectively. Now, Sunday I ministered, this past Sunday, I ministered on what is traditionally called Easter. I don't like to use the word Easter because it really has its roots in pagan, uh, pagan roots, actually. And not that I'm legalistic about that whatsoever, but I like to call it Resurrection Day. And so when people would say Happy Easter on Facebook, I would say, well, Happy Resurrection Day. But since Sunday was Resurrection Day, let me submit to you tonight that we never really ever had an old man that had to be gotten rid of and that we would then get a new man. Now, what we were taught originally was that we had to accept Jesus as our Savior. The old man was crucified, and as we accepted the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we then would get a new man. But what I want to share as I begin tonight is we've always had a new man. We see it a little bit differently now. We see the cross a little differently, and we see it in a, a, a greater way, a more fuller way. And that is that Jesus' death exposed the lie, and I could say his death exposed the lie that we ever were an old man and that we needed to get a new man. His resurrection revealed that we always were a new man. So what I see and what I want to submit to you this evening is I see the old man, those words old man, as a metaphor for left-sided thoughts in and of themselves, for the lower thoughts. Now I want to read a scripture in light of the fact that Jesus' resurrection revealed the truth of who we always were. And that verse is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. And it says these words, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality. Now the next two words are the key words, hath brought, he abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light. In other words, we were always in possession of life and immortality. I believe it's John 10.10 10, that talks about Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He didn't bring us life. The word have there is to conceive, and we conceive in our awareness, in the feminine part. The word have means to conceive and to hold. 
So he did not bring us life. He revealed that we are always had life. And here in 2 Timothy 1.10, he abolished death. Where? In our awareness. Thinking that death had a power. And he brought to light immortality that we always had immortality. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into Revelation chapter 10 and then 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. Now, let me read a scripture to back up what I was saying, because I like to document everything. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 and 24, it is talking there about the old man and it's talking about the new man. And I want to read those verses to you. It says that you put off concerning the former conversation. Now, conversation means conduct there. And we know the thing that determines our conduct is what we have between our ears. Because our awareness is a projector. If you believe you're an old man, you're always going to act like the person you believe yourself to be. And that's what's going to be projected out of your life since our awareness, our individual awareness is a projector. So it says there that you put off concerning the former conduct. It says conversation in King James, but it's conduct. The old man. Put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Now, the only way we put off the old man is by getting rid of the stinking thinking mm -hmm. and taking on the thoughts of the right side, the Christ mind. Then it goes on to say in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind or the mind that's in your spirit or the renewing mind or the Christ mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and, and notice in the la verse 23, it's not, a, it's not a period at the end of the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It's a colon. And then it goes on to say, so that's not the end of the sentence, where it says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24 says, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So what am I submitting tonight? I am saying that the old man is metaphor for thoughts. The new man is metaphor for the higher thoughts, for putting on the Christ mind. Now, we all know that we came here according to Ecclesiastes 7.29. We've been over this a lot of times. We came here upright. We didn't come here as a sinner. Colossians 1.21 tells us that thinking we were a sinner, thinking we were alienated from God, thinking that we were enemies of God as an old man or as a sinner was in our mind. And again, we always act like the person we believe ourselves to be. So in other words, because people judged by appearances, they looked at people and they said, oh, they have horrible behavior. They're acting like a schnook. Because they judge them by the appearance realm, so therefore, well, they must be a sinner. They must be an old man because of the way they're acting and because they were judging them by the realm of appearance. But we are not and have never been an old man. Now, it looked like we were because of what we, the seeds we sowed into our awareness that were projected out. But we were always a new man. We were always upright, always holy, always righteous. So here's how we used to teach then. And I, I was one of the big ones that taught it this way. My old man had to be crucified on the cross. Old man had to be crucified on the cross. And I had to receive then, and I did through the quickening, raising, and seating. And as I appropriated that, I then received the new man. Now, what did Jesus say on the cross when he hung there? He said, it is finished. What does it mean? The baffling wind or the lie of self. Or the baffling lie that I was an old man, that I ever was an old man. That's what it means. See, now his death exposed the lies, and one of them being that I was an old man, that I came here as an old man rather than upright. But the resurrection revealed the truth that I was always a new man, that I never was an old, an old man that needed to go to the cross and be crucified. The thing that was crucified, the thing that had to be buried and die then was the old way of thinking and that's what Jesus dealt with when he went to the cross and when he said he took the it to the cross it is finished he took the it to the cross the it was what the baffling lie or wind of ever being an old man the baffling wind of self lowercase s the baffling wind of self so in the resurrection truth was
was revealed to us as to who we always were. And so therefore, as we accept and embrace that truth, what are we doing? We are slipping into the awareness of I am, which then puts off, swallows up the baffling wind of self of thinking that I was ever an old man. Now, another one I want to look at is in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, and everyone is very familiar with this. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I'm going to read this out of the, uh, the King James Version, but I will share with you what the Greek really says at the beginning. The King James Version of Galatians 2, 20 says, I am crucified. But the Greek there says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, or as me, and the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you've got two eyes there. What is it talking about? Well, the eye that was crucified was the baffling wind of self. It was the lie that I was an old man. Now, in quantum physics, there is this that is called the poly, if I'm pronouncing it right, the poly, P-A-U-L-I, principle. And what it says is two entities, or we could say two men, people, could not live in the same space at the same time, or cannot be in the same space at the same time. You know, like, I remember the church, they used to be so big on casting out demons. You know, and someone would come with a multiple personality disorder, and we would say, well, we need to uh, cast this other person out of them. Well, listen, two entities cannot maintain the same space at the same time. And so, therefore, I could not have two eyes in me. As Paul is saying here in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Again, it's not two personalities or two entities or two people when he says that. It's lower thoughts that embrace the lie of being an old man and the I that I have always been or the I that lives is what? The I of Christ, the new man that always lived. So he says, nevertheless I live, yet not I, a lower awareness of me, but the higher awareness of me has always lived and shall always live. So. When we read verses such as Galatians 2.20 of being crucified with him, Romans 6, 7, and 8 where we died with him, Romans 6, 4 where we were buried with him, it is in reference to who we thought we were but never really were. It was the lower way of thinking. We could say it was the left side in and of itself. And then when we read about the quickening, the raising, and the seeding, what is the quickening? The word that the resurrection revealed was quickened or made alive in us, which constitutes the new man. So we were quickened. The truth was quickened in us, raised us up to realize we've always been a new man, mm -hmm. caused us to be seated or be at rest in him. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, And so that's how we see that now. Rather than my old man that I was at one time had to be crucified, died, and buried, and then I became a new person as I embraced that. I was quickened and raised and seated as the, the new man or the new life that I am. Now, all of that constitutes living in the end. All of that constitutes living in the end, collapsing time, and as we'll see later, it represents or it speaks to us of creating a vacuum. Now, Jesus said in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 13, he declared himself to be the Alpha and the Omega. Let me read it to you. Revelation 22, 13, I am Alpha and Omega. What is that? The beginning and the end of the Greek alphabet. It starts at a time and it ends. It's like linear. It's like a timeline. I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, the first and the last. What was he really saying here? Because he wasn't saying, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, in the sense of linear time, or last and first, or alpha and omega. What he was saying was, I am swallows up all time. Mm, so good. I am, the realization of I am collapses time. Yes. That's really what he was saying there. No one has a beginning or an end. 
That's good. You know, if we believe we had a beginning of time, then we believe we're going to have an ending of time. No, we evolved out of God. We always were. That's we just weird. can't. That's one of the meanings of create. I think it's bara in the Hebrew. And it means to cut down for a formative process. And what that cutting down means is to bring out of the invisible realm to manifest in the visible realm. That is so good. So you see, no one has a beginning or an ending because we are ages, eternal beings. We always were and we always will be. Now, I want to go to Revelation chapter 10. If you want to follow along, I'm going to read a few verses. I'm going to give you my paraphrase of these verses because I see a message here. And it's really a message that's coming forth to us right now in this series yes. as I'm teaching this message tonight. Yes. There was a seventh trump that sounded. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go into Corinthians and we'll see it's called the last trump. But here in Revelation 10, I want to read verses 1 through 6. Mm -hmm. And here we see seven is the number of completion, fulfillment, but also divine intervention. Mm -hmm. Divine intervention. So this is the message of it is finished. This is the message, as this trumpet sounds, it's a message of it, the lie, the baffling wind of self, mm -hmm. is finished. It's a message of the old man thinking I ever was an old man is finished. That it's is so done. Good. Okay? So let me begin reading there in Revelation 10, verses 1 through 6. Verse 1 says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Angel is just a message, a messenger with a message, or we could say just a message that uh, ne doesn't necessarily come from a person external to you. It may just come, you know, directly from within us. But no matter if it comes from a person external to you, it still has to be caught. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Still has to be caught. So notice it came down from heaven, the realm of spirit within us. See, when it, when it comes down from the realm of heaven, from spirit to our feminine principle or our awareness then it can be said that it is reality to us. We caught it. It's quickened by spirit. When it really comes out of heaven and comes into our individual awareness, then we're getting it. And notice it says, clothed with a cloud, this angel or message, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were, the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Now, my paraphrase of this is this. A message within us, came from our right side to our left side, accompanied by his presence, because that's what the cloud represents, which we are. comes from his presence, which we are, the cloud. And his, or our consciousness, was that of an eternal dimension. That's the rainbow. I don't look so much at, you know, anymore at Old Covenant, New Covenant. There was an eternal covenant that was given in Genesis. Yeah. That's the rainbow, an eternal covenant, okay? And his face shone as a result of all the energy fields that were opened, and his walk was fully cleansed, and the two, the right and the left, were joined. That's kind of long there, but that's, that's what I hear there. there. There's a message coming out of heaven within us, and it's clothed with a cloud, his presence, and a rainbow, the eternal covenant, was upon his head, and his face was, as it were, the sun. It's S-U-N, so it's connecting this with the energy fields being open. And his feet were as pillars of fire. In other words, his walk was a cleansed walk. Yes. This is what he's talking yes. about. Yes. Then verse 2 goes on and says, And he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. Now, my translation of this is, or paraphrase is, he had in his right hand the book within, the book that Revelation 5, 1 talks about, within the Esoteros book, the book of spirit. He had in his right hand, and in Revelation 5, 1, it talks about the little book, the esoteric book, being in his right hand, which was revealed to him. And he had the individual awareness, the feminine principle, joined with the inward book, which he brought to the sea of humanity. See, once the two are joined in us and we've been caught by this message from within, then what happens? It says there that his right foot was upon the sea. In other words, it was brought to the sea of humanity. We're bringing this to humanity, which was troubled. Yeah, oh gosh. Mm -hmm. Because Isaiah talks about, you know, yeah, the, the wicked truth. being as the troubled, troubled sea. sea. And yeah. wicked is not people yeah. that do terrible things. Wicked are just people that are restless and they're, they don't understand this. 
And so his right foot was on the troubled sea and to those of the earth who were confused. Earth mm -hmm. speaks of what? Confusion. Yeah. It, later in Revelation, it talks about... Um, Very much confused. It talks about the uh, millstone cast into the earth. Yeah. What is a millstone? A millstone is what they used to break up the grain to make the bread. So this millstone is a word that is broken down mm -hmm. into very fine, mm -hmm. made simple, yes. and is cast to the earth realm of confusion. That's what it's talking about. So verses mm -hmm. 1 and 2 speak of us. Okay? Well, it gets better as we go here. It gets gooder and gooder. Verse 3. And cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, my translation is, and he spoke the message with a thundering boldness. Come on. We're speaking this message with yeah. a thundering boldness. And, he, and as he did, it was a message of divine intervention and of awareness of it is done. The baffling wind of self is mm. finished. I've never been an old man. I only thought I was an old man. That is finished. Mm -hmm. Through the intervention, the divine intervention of, of, of spirit within us, quickening this word to us. And then verse 4 says, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven within saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now, my translation is, When the message of fullness was uttered by these seven messengers, not necessarily seven, but the full message of it is finished. I was told to write no more because this message from the highest heaven must be caught rather than taught or read. That's what I hear in that. If it's not caught by spirit within us, it's not going to do us a whole lot of good. It's just, it's just head knowledge rather than knowledge that is intuitive knowledge. And what did uh, Jesus say in John? You will know the truth, know it intuitively, not just in our head. We'll know it intuitively, and that will make us free. Now, verses 5 and 6. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, verse 6, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. So there we have the message. When we're walking in resurrection life, we're living in the end, and the end means what? I see that I am, and we are collapsing time. We see that we are now, not tomorrow, we're collapsing time, and then we're going to create this vacuum. Now, what the that's the message of Revelation chapter 10. Time no longer. Amplified says, no more intervention of time. In other words, this message that comes from within us, the esoteris, the little book, to all mankind is that all must hear from heaven for themselves and from within and live in the end by realizing I am and by collapsing time by realizing now I am and then later on we'll talk about creating the vacuum. So this message here in Revelation chapter 10 is really telling us what I'm teaching tonight. As verse 9 states, a people are going to eat the book. They're going to devour it. Mm -hmm. Meaning what? What happens when we eat the book, when we devour it? Mm -hmm. You know, one place I think it says it's, you know, uh, sweet in the mouth and bitter in the stomach, I think it says. Mm -hmm. What is that talking about? It's a bittersweet message. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a bittersweet message because, listen, as the truth comes, as we put on the mind of Christ on our right side, yield the left side, that can be bitter sometimes. So this message is a bittersweet message as we yield, and that's creating the vacuum. As we yield our left side in and of itself and no longer operate in mere intellect, human reasoning, or natural uh, logic, what are we doing? We're creating a vacuum, and listen, nature abhors a vacuum, and when you create a vacuum, spirit is going to rush in and fill that place. That's what happens. Now, Go, if you will, to 1 Corinthians. I guess I said 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15. And here it talks about the last trump. The last trump. Revelation 10 talked about the seventh trump, a message of fullness. 
And what is the message of fullness? Collapse time. It is finished. Live in the end. Realize that the resurrection revealed who we have always been. And we collapse time with that. Just as Jesus did when he turned the water into wine. What are we realizing as we collapse time? I'm not going to be that. I am that right now. I am that right now. Now, here in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 52 and 53, it talks then about the last trump. And notice it says, begins with, in a moment. Now, in a moment has a number of meanings. One of them is anatomous, and it means in the atoms of our physical body. We're beginning to see something different about the atoms of our physical body. Not that one day they will be quickened necessarily, not that they are immortal atoms and cells in our body, but really they already are. So in a moment here can be applied to the anatomist, the atoms of the body. And then it says in the twinkling of an eye. Now what makes our eye twinkle? In the natural, it's not only when you see the sun and it shines upon you, but it's when that sun penetrates. Mm -hmm. Your eyes begin to twinkle. So mm -hmm. what happens spiritually? When truth is quickened to us, there's a twinkle in the eye. Mm -hmm. The single eye begins to twinkle, it begins to vibrate. The vibrational level is raised. That's what happened to Peter when people, you know, were just came within the range of his high vibrational level and they were instantly healed. His vibrational level was lit. There was a, tw a twinkling, if I can talk, of the eye of the single eye in Peter, and that vibrational level was raised. And it goes on to say, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, where are we changed? Not in the cells of our body, in our awareness. That's where the change is taking place. Then it goes on to say, for this corruptible, and that's talking about between the ears, for this corruptible, must put on. Now, must is really the word uh, exist, like shall. Right now, any corruptible thoughts of our left side that we're tempted to think out of in and of themselves, that's corruptible thinking. But when we bring the incorruptible thoughts from the right side, what does it do? It swallows up. It swallows up the corruptible thoughts. And this mortal must put on immortality. Now, I understand that morte is where we get the word mortal, we get mortuary, and it has to do with the body. So in other words, once the incorruptible thoughts are a part of our thinking, our awareness, it projects out to the physical body, and it doesn't necessarily change the cells, but it reveals to us, or it wakes the cells up to realize they've always been immortal cells. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it means in Romans chapter 8 where it talks about the, the, if the resurrection life of Christ dwell in us, it will what? Quicken our mortal body. Quicken means it just makes our cells alive to realize that they have always been immortal cells. Because we have really heard and we're really knowing and we're living in the end. That's what it means to live in the end, to realize I am immortal. I am one. I am health. I am wealth. I am all things because he is all in all as all. Okay? That's living in the end. To realize it's not a, a time in a time frame that I'm going to get healed or get finances, have enough money to pay my bills. It's not someday. No. He is my wealth. He is my health. He is all. See? Objectively, the seeds of immortality, the seeds of wealth and health and all things have already been placed within us in the invisible realm. And as we come to that realization, you see, then what happens is our body begins to be quickened with that. We begin to know that that always has been our reality. So when we live in the end, and when we collapse time, well, let me back up a little further, because this was the message for Resurrection Day. When we're walking in resurrection life, we are living in the end, because we know, I'm not going to get resurrection someday, I am resurrection. 
I am resurrection personified, at least objectively. I may not be subjectively walking in it yet, but I, that still doesn't change the fact that I am immortal. I am resurrection. I am health. I am wealth. I am all. So when we walk in that resurrection life, we are living in the end because we're knowing who we are That's right. objectively. And when we realize we are that right now, yes. then we're collapsing time. And we're also creating a vacuum. That's it. Now, let me give some definition of creating a vacuum or a vacuum, first of all. The word vacuum is used as a noun and also as a verb. As a noun, it means a state of awareness of being sealed off from external or environmental influences. That is so good. Uh, is. <laughs> See, so if good. someone creates a vacuum, oh my gosh. they leave a place or position which then needs to be filled with something else. Okay? Aristotle said that nature abhors a vacuum. When you remove something, something has to fill it up. So when we remove by yielding the left side, we, we remove the, the uh, linear thinking, we remove uh, intellect or, or mere logic or human reasoning, then what are we doing? We are creating a vacuum as we yield the left side and spirit is going to rush in and especially spirit is going to rush in as we bring the Christ mind. That's creating a vacuum there. Now, as a verb, it means, say, and then let me back up and say, and then you're sealed off from any external or environmental influences that would come and try to harm you. Mm -hmm. Now, as a verb, it means to create a natural flow. Now, the example that I gave on Sunday evening is if uh, a nurse is taking blood from your arm, they will put a needle in your vein, and they will pull back on that syringe just a little bit to remove the air. And then the blood begins to flow. If they have a good vein, at least. The blood will naturally begin to flow. Okay? That's how it's used as a verb, to create a natural flow. So therefore, when you and I live in the end, or we collapse time, and we are yielding the thoughts of the left side, what are we doing? We are creating a vacuum. And as we bring the thoughts of Christ into oneness with the left side, then what happens? We are sealed off from external environmental influences that would try to come and harm us in any way. So to live in the end is to live in the awareness of I am and that is going to begin to seal off any negative influences that would come from the external realm, whether it be sickness, whether it be, you know, any kind of so-called problem will be sealed off from that when we create the vacuum by yielding the thoughts of the left side in and of themselves and bringing in the Christ mind. That's when spirit will naturally begin to flow. Yeah. That's when you're talking about the blessings seeking you out to overtake you rather than you seeking a blessing. When you realize that you are every single solitary thing you think you have need of, when you realize I am that, you're living in the end. And you're collapsing time because you're realizing I'm living in the end now. <laughs> I am that right now. It may not look like it, but I am that right now. Now, the word seal there, where it's used as a noun to seal, be sealed off from external environmental influences, seal and sealing and sealed is quoted quite often in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. For example, in Revelation 7, we can see where each of the tribes were sealed. What was it that caused them to be sealed was their awareness. Again, see, they yield the left side, create the vacuum, bring the Christ mind, and what happens? The two become one, and you're sealed off from external influences that would come in to harm you. Absolutely. Now, the word sealed in Strong's is 4972 in the Greek, and it also means to stamp with a signet or private mark for security or preservation. It's like you're marked. Who was it? Cain had a mark upon him? Mm -hmm. See, that he would not be killed? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, it's a mark of preservation. 
it leads to another number, 4973, which means a fencing in or a protection from misappropriation. A fencing in or protection from misappropriation. That is so good. The stamp impressed as a mark of privacy or genuineness. Mm. We were sealed with what? The Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. the scripture says. And we can apply ourselves to this group in Revelation chapter 7 as well. And we may look at that shortly, not tonight, but where it talks about us being sealed. And it lists all of the tribes there. Like Judah means praise. So how would we apply that? I am praise. Mm -hmm. Levi, ministry. I am spiritual ministry. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. Ephraim, double portion. I am double portion. Mm -hmm. Joseph, to augment or to add to. I am. Mm -hmm. I have been and I am that which has been added unto by all things. Now, as we live in the awareness of our I amness, again, what we're living in the end, we're collapsing time and we're creating a vacuum where we are sealed off from external environmental influences. Now, this is what I shared with you quite some time ago when we talked about epigenetics. How epigenetics is a science today where they are saying that a very low percentage of disease comes from our gene pool. Very low percentage comes from our mother or father's diseases that they had. And of course, you go into the doctor's office right away if you're a new patient, they're going to take all your history, ask about your parents, what they died from, blah, blah, blah. Epigenetics is saying now that it is based upon diseases and many things concerning the physical body are based upon our environment. So what are we talking about here when we're talking about environment where epigenetics is concerned and where being sealed off from outside external influences are concerned? We're talking about our environment becoming totally spiritual. And our environment becomes totally spiritual when we create the vacuum by yielding the left side bringing the right side to bear, and the two are joined together. We're sealed off. We seal ourselves off. And the way we change our environment is just simply by changing our awareness, no longer thinking on a linear timeline, but we collapse time. We see the end from the beginning, and remember that's what Isaiah said, that God declared the end from the beginning, meaning what? There's no time, space, or distance. And when we rule out time, space, and distance concerning who we are, and we realize our I amness, we're seeing the end from the beginning. We're practicing that. We're collapsing time. And we are also creating a vacuum. Because when we live in a vacuum, it's always going to be filled up. Spirit will rush in because nature, according to Aristotle, nature abhors a vacuum. And as we create a vacuum by letting the air-headed thoughts out <laughs> of the left side where the left side is concerned, we're yielding that left side, we bring the right side, spirit rushes in, and things begin to flow. Just like that needle they put when they take the air out, the blood begins to flow. Things begin to flow for us. Instead of us seeking out things, things seek us out. And we tap into that experience of fruit that remains. So I'm done. As I started, resurrection life, when we are walking subjectively in resurrection life and experiencing it, what are we doing? We're living in the end. We're collapsing time and we're creating this vacuum so that things can naturally flow. And that's what we want. See, that's where the fruit that remains comes in when the natural flow is there. Now, of course, we've talked about the subconscious, rewiring and reprogramming the subconscious. And that is really fruit that remains that begins to flow out, and it flows out naturally. But even in our individual awareness, as we join the masculine and the feminine together, and we live in the end by living in that resurrection life, we're collapsing time, and we're creating a vacuum to where things will begin to just naturally flow within our life. Amen. Father, we thank you.
your spirit mm -hmm. is quickening and making these truths a reality in our lives mm -hmm. that we can experience them, walk in them, and really bear fruit that remains. Thank you for your spirit that you've given us. Thank you for the enlightenment. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for who you made us from before the foundation, who we always were. We never were an old man, always a new man, always holy and righteous and upright. Thank you for this awesome revelation. Let it be quickened within us, by spirit within us. We thank you. We honor you in the name of the Lord. Amen.